The Bournemouth University, Dorset Healthcare University NHS Foundation Trust and Beat, Beating Eating Disorders logos are shown at the top of the screen with the text. Award winning comic Dave Chawner explores eating disorders, mental health and identity in his new show Normally Abnormal. More text reads, hosted at the Old Fire Station as part of the Comedy Nation. The gig is in support of Beat, the UK's eating disorder charity and is supporting Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2016. The Comedy Nation logo is also on screen. This is followed by more text. Dave Chawner uses comedy as a tool to discuss issues around eating disorders. Please be aware that his performance contains strong language and refers to adult themes. The performer's views don't necessarily represent those at Bournemouth University, Dorset Healthcare University NHS Foundation Trust or BEAT. Dave talks to camera and introduces the video. Hi, my name is Dave Chawner and I am going to be performing here tonight at the old fire station in Bournemouth as part of Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2016, which is very exciting, so I hope you enjoy it. Dave Chawner is stood on stage wearing a Beat t-shirt surrounded by Bournemouth University banners. The Comedy Nation logo is in the background. This is a show called uh, Normally Abnormal and this is a show uh, kind of uh, about life, right? And I'm very much aware you're probably looking at me thinking what's this 27 year old prick thinks that he knows about life, right? <laughs> Uh, and the answer's nothing. It's a really short show, right? Because <laughs> it comes off the back of a show I did a couple of years ago where I thought I had all of the answers. And I now realise that I'm wrong, and that's where the concept of normally abnormal comes from. So a couple of years ago now, I did a show all about how I have anorexia. So for the past 10 years, I've, I've been anorexic, right? You know, everyone needs a hobby, right? <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love that reaction, you know what I mean? That's great. Down here, they were like, we find that funny, we don't want to fucking give it. At the back, that ice, our arsehole tighten like an elastic band. That is, that is great, look at that. Getting a comedy boner there, that is beautiful. No one knows how to react, no one does, do they? No one knows how to react to this stuff. And I'm gonna be very honest, I'm not, I'm not gonna take the piss out of anorexia. I'm not going to mock eating disorders, but then at the same time, it is something that I refuse to be embarrassed about as well. It's something that I, I you know, it's not something I chose, so at the same time, it's not something that I'm going to apologise for. Um, and it doesn't change who I am, because you, you know, you can see me, I'm not like butch or tough. Like, I'll be honest, I don't even have a strong bladder, right? <laughs> like, if you saw me in the street, you're not going to think, Fwa, alpha male. Which one like thinks, oh, vegetarian. Right? <laughs> and you would be right as well. Uh, I've, I've been veggie for a while now, right? And there are certain things I miss, uh, like respect. Angle changes. <laughs> <laughs> Have we got any veggies in, by the way? Any, any veggies in? <laughs> wow, normally they're too weak to cheer. This is... <laughs> ah, my little children of the corn down here. That is... That's great. Hey, Bournemouth. Like, it's great. Because when I, when I did this show in Edinburgh, the, the, honestly, true, I did this show in Edinburgh and I said, have we got any vegetarians in? And one bloke put his hand up at the back and said, how long have you been veggie, mate? And he just looked at me and went, two hours, right? <laughs> it doesn't make you vegetarian if you haven't had haggis at lunch, right? <laughs> but being vegetarian, as you will probably know, it's, it's an identity label. And at Source, this show is kind of uh, about identity. Uh, and like any kind of identity label, it's something that people can use to set you aside and malign you. Great example of this, uh, I get a lot of animosity for being a vegetarian, especially off blokes as well. Like they always go, oh Dave, if you're not veggie, you're gay. <laughs> it's like, well no, because I don't do sausage, right? <laughs> <laughs> Silly little joke. Uh, fucking love that. Uh, but no, that, that's the, also, as well, I'm going to trip over the, the box on the, on the floor. That would never happen live at the Apollo, would it? Um, but also, like, uh, kind of, like any identity label, it's something that changes based on your cultural bearing, right? I'll give you an example of that. I recently went to Spain. Now, going to Spain as a vegetarian is a bit like going to Cadbury World as a diabetic, right? <laughs> They, they just don't have it out there. I didn't realise that. Like, we went to a restaurant, and I said to the waiter, like, really sorry, mate, do you have any veggie options, right? He looked at me like I'd shit in the till. And I said, I'm really sorry. Like, do you just have anything without meat, right? He looked at me, looked at the menu, and went, we've got duck. <laughs> I said, well, duck is still meat, right? He said, one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. He went, well, it swims. It's part fish.
there's a kind of logic there, you know? But like any identity label as well, um, it's kind of something that I use, because again, it's very, it's very pertinent as well. When I kind of slipped into anorexia, it was a gradual thing. It didn't start overnight, and it took me a while to realise, right? So I guess I was kind of embarrassed. I guess I was ashamed. I also didn't really know what was going on. And people kept on saying to me, Jesus, how are you losing so much weight so quickly, right? And I didn't know what was going on. So I used to tell them it was a combination of the Atkins diet coupled with being vegetarian, right? Just sounds much nicer, right? Because one of the things I found about doing this show is how uncomfortable people get talking about undereating, which is quite, quite interesting. Because if you look at comedy, there's loads of comics that talk about overeating, like Johnny Vegas, PK, Ricky Gervais, they always talk about overeating. And they build up lazy body stereotypes, like, you know, sort of fat people are always meant to be sort of jolly. Fat people are sort of generally quite trustworthy, because generally we tend to trust fat people. Um, not around food, obviously, but... <laughs> I fucking hate that joke. Right, I genuinely... That is everything that I am against, yet it still gets a laugh and I'm a prick, so I... <laughs> I mean, I do hate it. But I think it's a good point. Like, I, think, I think we are spun this narrative that you do trust fat people. Like, a great example of this, look at Santa, right? You'd never trust a skinny Santa, would you? Right? Some thin, unshaven bloke that breaks into your house on Christmas night. You call the police as a drug addict and he's squatting in my lounge, right? And I hate that body shaming. I hate that. Like, a great example of this. Recently, in America, there was a man that went to buy a tri uh, ticket to board a plane. Now, the guy publicly shamed him and said, sorry, sir, because you're so fat, you're going to have to buy two seats. And this is a kind of culture of body shaming that we've got into. But what is beautiful in this story is that it has a hero. And that hero is that man. Because that man turned around to the really rude guy that had just shamed him in front of everyone. I went, all right, if I have to buy two tickets... I'll buy two tickets. I'll buy one at the front of the plane and one at the back of the plane. <laughs> like that. And I think that's great, right? Angle changes. So we do, we do like, sort of build up these, these stereotypes and it's odd. Because I didn't realise, as I say, like, I didn't realise how uncomfortable people can get talking about under eating. And I wanted to use comedy because comedy has the unique ability to, uh, to sort of anesthetise things, to make things easier to talk about. Because when people are laughing, they're listening. When they're listening, they're learning. And when they're learning, you can help people who have eating disorders feel a bit of a release, but you can also kind of educate people who are lucky enough to have no point of reference in this. So it was a hard show to write because it had to be funny and it also had to be informative, right? And I didn't always get the balance right. When I did that original first show, one of the first reviews in the Leicester Comedy Festival said that a bit that I did on bulimia was too gag heavy, right? <laughs> It's like saying a show on domestic violence lacks punchlines, right? <laughs> Ridiculous. And, and I didn't realise that, because doing, doing the show those three years ago was a, a huge journey. And kind of in the show, I sort of outlined how I slipped into all this. And like I say, it was a gradual thing. Uh, and for me, one of, the, one of the first triggers was when I'd just got the lead role in a play, right? And in the play, I <laughs> also, it was a play called Sparkle Shark, right? <laughs> I'm not even gay, right? Uh, I'm as surprised as you do anything. So is my boyfriend. But I... <laughs> but I had, to, I had to be a topless in, in, in this play, right? And that was the first time that I'd ever really thought about my body image. So I just decided to sort of cut back on snacking, just have breakfast, dinner, tea, lost a bit of weight, wanted to lose a bit more. And then I started restricting more and more and more. And I'll be honest, uh, it's a great way to save money on food bills, right? Um, because people don't tell you is when you start skipping meals, what you lose in weight, you also lose in nectar points as well, right? It's not all happy families, right? And at this point in time, it was a healthy thing. At this point in time, it was just losing a bit of weight. But then something happened that changed it. Because as I started to lose the weight, I got noticed by this one incredible, beautiful, amazing, attractive, intelligent, funny girl. Uh, and for legal reasons, I, I couldn't name her. Uh, we'll get within 50 foot of her now, right? <laughs> but, all you need to know is uh, she was incredible. She was amazing. We started dating and I fell in love and she became my heroine, right? By which I mean she was addictive, exciting and fucking expensive, right? <laughs> But like heroin as well, she also became a cause for me to lose weight. She became something that inspired me to lose 
uh, less weight. Just the idea, the thought of it, not her consciously. In fact, she hated that I was skinnier than her, right? I'll never forget one conversation. Does my bum look big in this? Like, no, Dave. <laughs> Been over this, mate, right? But you have to understand that in my mind, I've begun to correlate losing weight with getting this incredible girl. So I started to think losing weight meant being good looking and losing weight meant being attractive. And I now know that's mental, right? Like no girl has ever been asked, what do you look for in the ideal bloke? Ooh, rickets. <laughs> but in my mind, that made sense, right? So inevitably when we broke up and she broke my heart, I thought that's because I was too fat. And that was when it spiraled out of control because it wasn't only a reaction to that. It wasn't vanity. It wasn't attention seeking. There was so much shit that I'm sure you guys can all resonate with. Stuff like exams, stuff like money, stuff like jobs and everything kind of fell out of control. And it became for me an addiction, obsession and a control. Now, if you're lucky enough to have no kind of point of reference, I'll explain that a little bit. So I became obsessed with exercising, all right? So anytime I'd eaten anything, I would, uh, no matter how small, as well, any time I'd eaten anything, I'd run upstairs, I'd do 50 push-ups, I'd do 50 sit-ups, I'd do 20 squats, right, all the, all the time. And I kind of, I, my mum and dad realised something was wrong, uh, but they never said anything to me, right? And it was only recently that I said to them, you know, if you knew about the exercise, then why did you never say anything to me? And my mum gave a beautiful answer, because she looked at me and she went, Dave, when your teenage son keeps on running up to his room, and all you can hear is rhythmical banging, <laughs> followed by repeated grunting, right? You tend not to ask questions, right? <laughs> Which I thought was great until my dad put his hand on her shoulder and I thought you were a sex pest, so, you know. <laughs> And it's, a, it's weird, like, because I did that, and also obsessional things as well. Like, I, I became obsessed with weighing myself. Like, I started weighing myself in the morning, uh, but that was before I'd eaten anything. It kind of felt like cheating, so I started weighing myself in the evening, see how much my weight fluctuated, and then kind of midday to kind of inspire me to eat less. On average, I used to weigh myself about five times a day, right? So I used to run upstairs, lock my bedroom door, and weigh myself. So sort of five times a day, I used to lock myself away. Right? Dad thought I converted to Islam as well, right? <laughs> Like when, he, when he found out what was going on, he was a little bit relieved, right? He said, oh, thank fuck for that, you know? Thought I was going to have to buy you a Koran, you know? He's not racist, he's northern, right? <laughs> and they're, they're just really expensive. Uh, I had to say to him, Dad, look, we've been over this, right? I'm vegetarian. It's pronounced corn. Uh, Angle changes. Slight side note on that as well, when we, when we took the show to the, we took the show to the Birmingham Comedy Festival, I didn't realise that uh, Brum, Birmingham, has uh, like one of the highest populations of Muslim people in the UK, which would normally be fine, but like one guy, one Muslim guy came to see the show and he came up to me afterwards and he said, great show, really enjoyed it. I said, well that's really nice mate, thank you very much. And he went, but one thing, right, you are such a pussy, because what you call anorexia, we just call Ramadan. Um, <laughs> Camera angle changes. So yeah, and I also, another obsession, I became obsessed with calorie counting as well. And to reduce calories, I reduce portion sizes, right? So what I call Sunday lunch, everyone else just called tapas, right? But no, the point that I'm making is though, that like, it was weird for mom and dad, because I was cheaper to feed than the cat was at this point in time. And, and they didn't know what to do, like with all of my kind of calorie counting, like, they went and sought help in the church, right? And I was going nowhere near that place, right? Bread and wine. Talk about empty calories, right? Yeah. I'm the only person to hear stories of miracles and be entirely unimpressed, right? I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's five loaves, there's two fishes, and 5,000 people. That's plenty to go around. So. It's too much, if anything. Yeah. Because I didn't realise I've got a problem. When I started doing that original first show, I, I kind of put it very much in the past and i never gone and sought formal therapy and i never gone and sought help because I never felt anorexic enough. And that's quite an interesting idea, really. Like, if one of your friends came up to you and said, like, I think I've got a, I think I've got a lump on, on my chest, most people wouldn't go, well, wait until that lump is the size of a melon, right? And then go, go to the GP, right? But I kind of felt that with mental health. It was weird, and I kind of let it go on for ages. So I was kind of stuck at this point where Hollywood teaches us that you had to have this like, cinematic Hollywood like, moment where I had to kind of have a breaking point, right? And that never really happened. So I had to kind of engineer one. And it was one that kind of, it, it did happen. Like, basically, I ended up in hospital, right? And I ended up in hospital due to coffee loading. 
Uh, and in case you don't know what that is, coffee loading is where you start to substitute uh, food for coffee, right? Because coffee gives you all of the energy, but none of the calories of food. Now, one of the things you want to realize about caffeine is it reduces your pulse rate, right? And when you've got no fuel in your body, um, that reduces your pulse too. And so my pulse got down to about 46 beats a minute, right? It's about the average 80s pop ballad, right? <laughs> There's no need for that joke. I stick that in just for me. Right? Um, <laughs> So it's ridiculous. I've done this show 60 times, always change that. Um, no one needs to know that. But yeah, anyway, so I got rushed to hospital. And while I was there, I got talking to this builder, right? And he was, he was like a lovely bloke. And uh, turns out he was there because he'd circular sawed through his femur, right? <laughs> and after a while, like the triage nurse said, look, you've got to talk to him because um, apparently one of the best ways to make sure someone is all right, like their blood pressure is high enough, is if they're still conscious, if they're still talking. So we had to talk for fucking hours, right? Uh, which is really awkward, because I didn't know this bloke. And, and after a while, he looked at me and he went, anyway, enough about me, what about you? Like, why are you here? Uh, and let me tell you, nothing is more embarrassing in life than when you look at a bloke who's bleeding out of the lower part of his body, and why am I here? <laughs> Too much coffee. <laughs> You look like a bit of a dick, right? Because I didn't realise that I kind of carried this through with me like when I went away to university. And when I went to university, I kind of studied, uh, I studied philosophy, right? Uh, it's a great course, but it's fuck all use, right? <laughs> no company has ever had a recruitment meeting and gone, well, we've got an accountant, we've got a lawyer, uh, have we got a philosopher? <laughs> When I started that course, I said, well, by the end of this, you'll be dealing with all of the big issues, right? Uh, and I didn't realise them in the magazine, right? <laughs> I didn't go it. I, I, went to, I went to the University of Southampton, right? I went to the University of Southampton purely because the motto of the department was, philosophers do it deep, right? <laughs> they really don't. Um, <laughs> Southampton's a weird place though, right? I, um, this is genuinely true. You ask anyone that lives in Southampton, at the bottom of my road, there was a shop mobility shop, right? And it was just simply called AIDS for the Disabled. <laughs> so fucking hell, they've got problems enough. Give them a break, right? So I was doing this course, I was doing philosophy, uh, and it was in the height of the recession. And everyone kept on talking about jobs and no one's going to get jobs and stuff. So when one became available uh, during the summer, it was something that I jumped at. And uh, the, the job that became available was teaching English to international kids in Dover. And something you need to know is uh, Dover's a shithole, right? Like, it's, if you haven't been, don't, right? It's, Dover's the only place that's ever made me doubt evolution as a theory, right? <laughs> Horrendous. I didn't know that. Apparently, like, it's because, like, it may be because so many people are like passing through. They're incredibly racist, right? I didn't know this. And word got out into the local area that there were foreigners in the local school. And we had to call the police out three times. Uh, we got broken into twice. Uh, one of the teachers got punched. Right. One of the kids nearly got lifted. Right. And the police sort of said to us, "Look, we're really sorry. We can't guarantee your safety. So we did the only thing that we could." And we went on to lockdown. And that meant that no one could, no one could get into the campus because we couldn't get out. So yeah, we were in Dover, right? And we had to go on to lockdown, right? Nobody could, nobody could kind of get out uh, so that it stopped other people getting in. And that was really weird because like, that, that, that caused us a problem, right? Because um, it was strange because the first time in my life I had no control over what I ate. And for everyone else it was fine, but you could only eat three times a day, right? And all the food was just pizza, <coughs> pasta, chips, right? That was it. And that really freaked me out. And it was amazing how much I couldn't deal with that. So I started skipping breakfast, having five or six cups of coffee every morning, and then I'd feel faint, I started getting dizzy, and then I started setting my alarm clock in the middle of the night, I started exercising when everyone was asleep, I started binging, purging, binging, purging, and one of the teachers came up to me and she said, look, I've been in therapy for bulimia three times, uh, have you ever thought that you might be anorexic? 
And it was just the fact that someone said it in just such a down-to-earth, normal way that kind of made me realise that, yeah, maybe this is something that I've got. And I accepted it. I acknowledged it, but I never did anything about it. And I never did anything about it because I never felt anorexic enough. And one of the things that I didn't realise is how much it affects your brain, right? So a good example for this, in, uh, in men, predominantly, your chemicals in your brain start to shut down. The brain needs about a thousand calories a day just to run. Now, when you don't get that, it stops secreting the chemicals. Great example, in men, you stop secreting uh, testosterone, which is like the manly chemical. So that's why, like, most anorexic men are quite camp and feminine and sort of, like, womanly. Like, my, my mom once described me as, like, the daughter she'd always wanted. <laughs> Well, Arsha, my sister, right? And, <laughs> and, and when, I moved to, when I moved to London, I moved to Brixton, right? And Brixton's like a little bit stabby, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, I'm like, and I didn't really fit in, because like, Brixton's like quite street, and I'm more kind of like Sesame Street, right? <laughs> And I really wanted to fit into it. We, we went to this like urban club, right? And I wore the hat, the chains, the really tight t-shirt. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, I'm fucking Tupac, right? Because <laughs> I was a dead man walking, right? And <laughs> as we got into the club, right, it was just filled with squaddies, right? And normally the only soldiers I get on with are with a softly boiled egg, right? <laughs> And this, like, this alpha male of the group came up to me, like, really aggressively went, Hey, blood, why is you dressed like that? Right? And I was like, Jesus. <laughs> it's because I was Tupac. <laughs> in it? And he just looked at me and went, Nah, blood, you just look like the gay one from Blue. And then fucked off, right? Another example as well is you start to lose your concentration as well. When the brain doesn't get enough fuel, it can't kind of, it's trying to like run a laptop when you haven't charged it, right? So it starts to shut down, so I can't really sort of like think, I can't, I'm very bad with concentration, very bad with attention span, and multitasking as well. Now my first job after university was working on a magazine, right? And on print, in print, when you sort of print the pages, you've got them all that are kind of like laid out, and you have to make sure they're all okay before they go to print. Now it's really stressful on deadline day, and I've got my editor that wanted to add something to one of the pages. I've got a client on the other end of the phone that wanted to change something with one of the adverts. And I've got the production staff saying, Dave, look, we need to print now. We have to go to print now. Now I've got everything going like this. Now I hadn't had breakfast. I just got five or six cups of coffee on my desk. And because I couldn't multitask, I knocked one over and it went all over the pages, destroying them. I went, Jesus, like that was a nightmare. My client on the other end of the phone went, Dave, are you all right? Sounds a bit manic over there. Now I meant to say, I'm really sorry, Sue. I've got people coming at me from all different angles. I'm a little bit frustrated. But because I can't concentrate, because I can Multitask. I'm really sorry, so I've got people coming all over me. <laughs> and then as if that could be bad enough, followed up with, oh Jesus, it's gone everywhere. <laughs> and it's like, also, it's like another one, no one talks about this as well. I, it, reduces your, it reduces your sex drive as well, so you kind of get a reduced libido. Like, the only thing I used to regularly toss was salad, right? Uh, <laughs> Which is odd, because when most people look at me, they think, oh, there's a wanker, right? <laughs> but no. <laughs> and like, you know, I'd, I'd seen blue movies, right, like Avatar. And, <laughs> and I just, I wasn't bothered, like, because I am of the generation that is the first generation that has mass media, easy to reach, free pornography. And that is demonstrative for the society that we're building. What, by which I mean that uh, porn doesn't rep represent real life, like, you know, porn is not representative of all. You need more realistic porn, things like Gone in 60 Seconds, right? <laughs> <laughs> and Deep Impact, right? Um, and uh, this is how low my, like, this is how low my attention span, uh, my kind of like uh, sex drive actually got, right? I once had to stop watching an adult movie because it depressed me, right? <laughs> And, and the reason it depressed me is, as I watched this man and this woman have sex in this beautiful apartment, all I could think was, I'm never going to be able to afford <laughs> to live in a house like that. <laughs> the only thing that made me feel better is I knew that the washing machine was broken, right? <laughs> <laughs> and when we did, like, when we did, right, when we did that first tour, 
uh, I was dating this girl, right? And it was a long distance relationship because I lived in London and she lived in the 18th century, right? So <laughs> kind of didn't really work. She, she had a very clandestine view of sex. She, she had a very high sex drive. Now, no girl should ever be ashamed of having a high sex drive, but she was and she wouldn't kind of do it publicly, which kind of drove it underground and made it quite clandestine, which I found quite intimidating, right? Like, we used to do like phone sex, right? Um, in case you haven't done phone sex, don't, right? All it is is just breathy women, right? It's like, oh, I'm so horny. It's like, no, love, you're asthmatic, right? And she'd say things to me like, oh, what are you going to do to me? I'm like, probably disappoint you, to me. So it's like, what? You know what I mean? And then she, she also, she bought the, the Kama Sutra, right? And Kama Sutra to sort of zhuzh up uh, sex life. A very interesting book, the Kama Sutra. You've got loads of different positions. You've got like the tax man, right? Which is where you just get fucked up the ass once a year. Uh, you've, you've got the 69 as well. And after the 69, you've got, you've got mouthwash, right? <laughs> Then my favourite, favourite of all of them, is the spider. Right? And in the spider, you have to have sex in a bath and she can't get out, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what you have to do is you have to trap her in a glass and throw out the window, right? It's very, very involved. Very involved. Because it's one of these things that people don't talk about. So it's like, you know, like, and, and sex is one of those things when you're in a, a committed relationship. It's one of those things you're, like, you're, you're expected... So you got to do it, uh, you got to do it like once a week, and it, it's kind of like, and you, you're always tired, so just before going to bed, it's, it's kind of like taking the bins out, right, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you're like, oh, is it the brown bins? And you just, just... <laughs> I, I don't like that, like, you know, kind of like, because I, I get quite sexually intimidated, right, like, and I find it quite, I, I found it quite scary, like, I've never had erectile dysfunction, you know, touch wood, but <laughs> that was a really weird moment when we locked eyes, mate. I mean, that was odd. <laughs> Bizarre for me, as I've never done that before. That was fucking odd. <laughs> I love how his hands like cupping his crotch now as well. It's like, whoop, um. but no, it's odd. Like, like, what I'm saying is like, put it this way: the only thing I want to go faster in my bedroom is broadband, right? And. <laughs> And, and, like, and that's why, like, the thing that I love about sex, because, again, I got very lonely with anorexia, I got very attached, and it, it does kind of isolate you. And the thing that I wanted more than anything was, was like, a spoon. I love spooning. I just think that's the bit of sex that I love. It's, like, after it's, it's genuine, it's post-coital, like, you're there and they're there, and you're just like, ah. Like, it's just a... <laughs> like, it's like, ah. Like, you can't be angry and spoon at the same time, right? Because that's molest. Um... <laughs> Well, there is such a thing as an angry spoon. It's called the Heimlich maneuver, right? <laughs> and that's that's how we broke up, right? So I was doing this tour, very asexual at the time. She had a very high sex drive, right? Um, I kind of did a gig. I came home late from a gig, right? She wanted to have sex. I just wanted to have a cuddle. It'd been an ongoing frustration. We had an argument. It escalated and ended in the words, "I wanted a boyfriend, not a fucking backpack." <laughs> Turns out when a woman says she wants an animal in the bedroom, she doesn't mean a panda, right? <laughs> Irony was, uh, when we started dating, she, she went on the pill, right? Oh, well, Prozac, but... <laughs> Here's another fucking doozy, right? She broke up with me the day before Edinburgh, right? So I was very lonely, very isolated. Went to Edinburgh, did that bit in Edinburgh. A girl came up to me after the show. And she went, is it, is it true you prefer spoon to sex? And I said, it's absolutely true, right? We went home for the first ever one night spoon. Right, it's amazing. <laughs> like, nothing, like, nothing sexual happened. We just lay there and like, oh, just, like, like, I wore protection, I had pyjamas on, right? And it's just, it's nice. And like, you know, because like, obviously, you know, so it was fun. The worst problem you got with a one night spoon is a dead arm, right? And, and like, now, I'm, that may be, I'm currently writing the Karma Spoon Tra, right? And, and in that, you've got loads of different positions. You've got like the one where your arms and legs are kind of entwined like that. And that's called the Virgin Media. And it's called that because once you get in that bastard, you can't get out. You are locked in, right? You've got the Nick Clegg. 
which is where you kind of promise one thing and then do the exact opposite. <laughs> There's loads of them. Because um, I'm writing a show as well at the moment. It's like a tangent, but it's lovely to be able to do this because uh, I'm writing a show at the moment. Unfortunately, this is honestly true. Uh, like four weeks ago, I had to be uh, circumcised, right? Um, I know, mental, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But no, it's true, because men don't really talk about this, and I didn't realise, put, put it this way, that the neck on my jumper was a little bit too tight, right? Um, so I'm writing a show about that. I want, I want to call the show From the Hood, right? <laughs> Either that, or Dave Chawner, now a little bit less of a prick, you know what I mean? <laughs> Anyway, point is, um, I, you know, it's kind of one of these things. I was talking about anorexia, but I never felt ill enough. I'd never gone and got treatment. I never kind of went soon. And uh, I knew anorexia was a big problem, right? It's affected people like Kelly Clarkson, Lily Allen, Victoria Beckham. It's a huge problem, right? Because it is responsible for a lot of shit music, right? <laughs> and I said to my housemate, do you know any famous male anorexics? And he just went, Gandhi? <laughs> No, like, men are much more likely to get bulimia, that's what the stats suggest, only about 10 to 25% of anorexics are men, depending on what you read. And I get asked a lot by journalists, like, what's it like being a man with anorexia? I'm like, well, I've never been a woman with anorexia, so I'll get back to you about that one. Uh, it's fucking ridiculous. And I, also, like, stats suggest as well, men are much more likely to get bulimia, and there's loads of examples of that. You've got people like uh, Freddie Flintoff, uh, like David Coulthard, Uri Geller, John Prescott, lead singer of Kings of Leon, Elton John was bulimic, uh, so Rocket Man, it's all about salad, right? <laughs> and that's my kind of problem. Like, we always look to celebrity to like condone stuff. Like, we always look to, I can't relate to people on film or TV because they're fucking morons, right? Like, I don't forget when I was nine, I watched, I think it was EastEnders or Coronation Street, and they did a plot line about anorexia, and it just simply went, Sue, do you want some Monster Munch? No. <laughs> <laughs> no that was it. That's it. I can't relate to these people. They're fucking idiots, right? Because I like to think that I'm quite down to earth, right? And, and by down to earth, we all know that's middle class for poor, right? Um, <laughs> You know you're middle class when you start using the word caramelised rather than burnt, right? <laughs> I live in Brixton and during the riots my flat got caramelised to the ground, right? <laughs> I get a lot of that off my, off my dad. Like my, dad, my dad's a very down to earth guy. My dad once described halloumi as rich man's chewing gum, right? It's just a great phrase. And we get a lot of this kind of pretension in food. Like nowadays, if you go to a kind of posh place, your food comes served on a slate. Or so you're essentially eating off a roof tile. Uh, and then your drink comes in a drain pipe. And when we were doing the show, it was my 25th. Uh, Mum and Dad took us out to a nice, expensive place and we had some overpriced, expensive drinks. Uh, and then we left Starbucks. <laughs> We just went to the cinema, right? Because films have always been one, one biggest thing, and in particular, uh, my favourite film of all time is Mrs. Doubtfire. Right, I fucking love that film. Like, Robin Williams was dressing up to get his kids back long before Fathers for Justice, right? <laughs> and when I did that show in Edinburgh for the first year, on the 11th of August, 2014, Robin Williams took his own life. And that shocked me, like it shocked so many others. Because he was a man that had got fame, he got fortune, he got respect, he got everything. And everyone kept on saying, he's got everything that you could physically want. But the thing that people kept on overlooking is that it's not what you physically have got, it's what you mentally have. And that kind of set off a series of events that really made me think. And since then, I became involved in a wonderful charity called Calm, that stands for the campaign against living miserably. And they taught me that suicide is the biggest killer of men aged 25 to 40. It kills more men than anything else, but we don't talk about that. And we don't talk about it because we partly we've got a horrible history of mental health in the UK. Like, another thing they taught me as well is you shouldn't really use the term commit suicide, right? Uh, because that's actually from legal verbiage. Uh, it's, you should actually say take your own life. Because up until 1961, uh, suicide was seen as attempted murder, right? So attempted suicide was seen as attempted murder. And if you tried 
to take your own life and you failed. Does anyone know what the penalty was? Death. That was it, it was death by hanging, right? <laughs> how ironic is that? It's like, did you fail? Let's show you how it's done, right? <laughs> it's like shitting in someone's mouth and telling them their breath smells, right? It's, and because we do that as a country, anything we don't like in the UK, we just box it up and we ship it off, uh, which is how we created Australia, right? <laughs> And um, like, even less than a hundred years ago, you used to be able to pay to watch the mentally ill, right? And obviously we don't do that anymore because we put on free gigs at universities, right? <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, uh, I, did, I didn't realise that I slipped into depression uh, and it kind of took me a while to realise because depression doesn't run in my family. My mum's a very brazenly optimistic person. My mum's the sort of person that uses phrases. Those are phrases. Like she was used to say, Dave, life's not about the destination, it's all about the journey, right? Forget the destination, it's just the journey. She's actually lost her job as a paramedic, right? <laughs> I don't know why this is, like people, people like, you always buy those things at like garden centres, those little phrases, right? We had a magnet that said, it's what's on the inside that counts, right? And that went on the fridge. And I could never understand, what's like, is that me or the fridge, right? And, and she like, she used to hate it. My dad's like proper pessimistic though. Like she always used to say, Steve, you've got to live every day like it's your last. And you just turn around and go, what, crying, right? Because when I was eight, my dad once took me aside and went, son, Life's like a box of chocolates, right? It's shit if you're diabetic. <laughs> so I didn't have a kind of history to kind of draw on. What happened were three things that kind of acted as a wake-up call, and they all happened after Edinburgh. So when I got back from the Fringe that year, when I'd done that first show, which was called Over It, I got a call from the BBC, right? And they'd seen the show, uh, and then they'd liked it, which was lovely, and they wanted to do a feature on me and on the show. And they wanted to do it on the topic of male anorexia, right? And they wanted to, they wanted to entitle it Manorexia, right? Um, this is something that, like Manorexia, it just sounds like the world's shittest superhero, right? <laughs> like, you're like Manorexia, and believe me, a boy, take you on the world one calorie at a time. You know? <laughs> In comes that psychic lack of iron, man. Um, <laughs> He doesn't do anything, he just faints, you know. <laughs> Captain Anemia, the whole fucking gang. Come on, right? And so that was, I don't know, it was lovely. And we did this and it went out on BBC One. They also seeded it online. And after that, off the back of that, became a load of different opportunities. And that was beautiful because it was good. And something else I want to say as well, that's not why I'm doing this. I didn't get into comedy to be a celebrity. I'm not bothered about this. I don't want to be famous or anything like that. Like, I've never really wanted to be on the telly. You know, the camera adds 10 pounds. You can <laughs> fuck off, right? Because um, people have said to me, well, you pointed out there is a gap in the market for the first famous male anorexic, right? It's not a very big gap, but... <laughs> But that's not why I'm doing this. I want to do this to, to sort of help people and help people like I did uh, with Beat. Uh, and Beat have been wonderful to me and they've kind of backed the show, backed the tour. And um, my biggest dream in comedy of all time has been to host a night at the Comedy Store in London. When I was going up to Edinburgh that year, my manager at Beat, Rebecca, she gave me a call and she said, Dave, we've done it. The last day of the tour, we put the Comedy Store in London and we'd like you to host it. I said, wow, that's amazing, but I was running late for a train. I said, I'm really sorry, Rebecca, I'm going to have to send you an email. So I ran to my train and sat down, and to remind myself, I pulled a pen out of my pocket, and right on the back of my hand, beat Rebecca. Right. <laughs> you can imagine what the bloke next to me thought, right? In his mind, this is just some really lazy domestic abuse, right? But I was in a really cheeky mood, so I looked at him and went, she deserves it, like that. <laughs> most awkward three hours of my fucking life, right? Uh, but that came up, that was the 15th of September, so that was a week after the, uh, the, the kind of the BBC thing, and then two days before the comedy store, I got a call from my agent, and he said, look, we've had a dropout for one of the stand-ins on Mock the Week, would you like to do it? Now, just to explain how Mock the Week works, uh, you have what they call stand-ins, you sit on the panel, there's you, Dara, Bree, and two others, and you, you play the games, you write the jokes, you do the intro, they point the camera, uh, and then you move off the panellists, like your Andy Parsons, Ed Burns, they all kind of come on. Now, if any of the panellists had fallen ill, or sort of drop dead, 
then I'd have been subbed on, right? And obviously that didn't happen, because hitmen are really fucking expensive, right? <laughs> But what's important is I'd just done this thing on BBC One, it was beautiful and it was great and the feedback had been amazing. I went and did the Comedy Store on the 15th of September 2014, it sold out, it's lovely, amazing crowd, beautiful crowd, it's been incredible. I'd just done my dream gig, I put the mic in the stand, I got backstage, I looked in the mirror and I knew that in eight hours I would be on set of my favourite show with my comedy god Dara O'Brien. And I sat there, I stood there, I looked in the mirror and I felt nothing. Like, I literally felt nothing. I just felt kind of diluted. I didn't feel happy. I didn't feel sad. I didn't feel anything. I just felt numb. And it was then that I realized that I got a problem. And people have told me to stop telling people what I think is kind of important, and it's not funny, but I think it's important to be honest. And yeah, I'm still going through therapy and I'm still on the antidepressants, and I'll be honest, yeah, there are times I still find it tough, but what's important is what I've learned from that. And I think a lot of the time, you get remembered a lot more from your mistakes rather than your successes. And I'll give you an example of that. I, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, had to write my grand's eulogy, right? She unfortunately died. And um, my grand did some amazing things. Incredible woman, amazing woman. Uh, but the one thing that I'll always remember her for is getting song lyrics wrong, right? She genuinely thought the opening lyrics to Summer of 69 was, I got my first real sex dream. <laughs> oh, I was five at the time, right? <laughs> Up until I was 15, that's why I thought it was called the 69, right? And that's why... Genuinely, we once went to a wedding, she got really indignant, she's like, I hate this song. I was like, Gran, how can you hate Abba? And she went, listen to the lyrics. See that girl, watch her scream, the kick in the dancing queen. <laughs> it's horrendous, Dave, right? I love that, people talk about that. People remember people like that. One of my mates told me the best one. He said his uncle genuinely thought the lyrics of the song was, and then I saw her face, now I'm gonna leave her. <laughs> Which I love for two reasons, right? One, I think that's funny as fuck, right? But secondly, none of you are ever gonna hear that song in the same way ever again, right? Angle changes. Before I do go, uh, a couple of things that I've got to say. Uh, the gear is absolutely free to get in. Uh, it's not free to leave, right? Um, the whole show is put on by Beat, which I mentioned earlier on is the UK's eating disorder charity. There is gonna be a bucket at the back. Uh, if you've got any change, if you just want to fold that up, uh, <laughs> put it in the bucket, that'd be great. Um, I do, like, I, I have been told to say by the charity, if you could each give £2.50, you know, a cup of coffee, price of a pint, that would be amazing. All the money goes directly to B. So that would be absolutely incredible. Second thing as well, um, also, as well, I should point out, if you haven't enjoyed, like, if you, if you haven't got any money, if you haven't got any money, that's absolutely fine as well. I don't want you to give out of kind of obligation. If you haven't got any money, that's cool. If you've enjoyed the show, tell your friends, your family. If you've enjoyed the show, tweet me. And Angle changes. So, my friends, so that is where I come to the idea of normally abnormal. And then the, the, kind, the concept of the show and why I came up with the idea is uh, that we, we all have shit in life, right? No, it doesn't have to be an eating disorder. It doesn't even have to be mental illness, right? We all have something in life that can be your Achilles heel, right? And that can make you feel abnormal. But the fact that we've all got one of those, the fact that it's common to all of us, shows that it is normal. So kind of in a way, I don't want this to be a show about me or anything I've done. I want it to, to be a show about identity and showing that when you are weak, then you can be strong. And when you kind of go wrong, that's when you can go right. And when you can take things that would upset you, shame you, and make you feel embarrassed, you can accept them, hug them tight, and make them your own. That's when identity begins. And we all have that ability, and in that way, we are all normally abnormal. So thank you so much for coming to the show. Please do stick around at the bar. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, Bournemouth. Thank you very much. Hey! Yeah. Dave walks off stage. The text on screen reads, 
a Storyfy for Eating Disorders Awareness Week, and we found that storyfy.com forward slash equality at BU forward slash eating hyphen disorders hyphen awareness hyphen week. Followed by, if you would like to find out more about the dignity, diversity and equality work at Bournemouth University, please contact Dr. James Palfman K, Equality and Diversity Advisor, diversity at bournemouth.ac.uk, www.bournemouth.ac.uk forward slash diversity. Facebook, Equality and Diversity at BU, Instagram, Equality at BU, Twitter, Equality at BU. The Bournemouth University Beat and Dorset Healthcare University NHS Foundation Trust logos are shown on screen.